Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Washington. In Europe, the crisis continues, perhaps continue, continuing to unravel, but that will be the subject of today's show. In Greece, Prime Minister Papandreou is out. Lucas Papademos is in. He's a former VP of the European Central Bank. And in Italy, Berlusconi is out. And Mario Monti is in. Monti is a former head of competition policy at the European Commission. He's also the chair of the European Trilateral Commission. And he's an international advisor to Goldman Sachs and Coca-Cola. Now joining us to talk about the underlying structural issues in Europe and how the European crisis in the Eurozone and how they should be faced are Paolo Manassi. He's a professor of macroeconomics and international economic policy at the University of Bologna. He worked as a consultant for the World Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, and was a consultant at the IMF. And Mark Weisbrod, he is co-director of the Center for Economic Policy Research in Washington, D.C. And he joins us, he's also a regular columnist at The Guardian, and he joins us from Washington. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. So, so Paolo, let's start with you. Uh, the, the, both of these new leaders seem quite committed to the... Uh, bailout packages to the policies of austerity. Uh, what is your opinion on how they are likely to approach the crisis? Well, <clears throat> I think that starting, let's start from Italy. I mean, Italy is, com is coming out from, uh, you know, almost 15 years of Berlusconi. So this is, is a real big, big, big change. And what Mario Montes will be trying to do with this technical government is to, you know, pull enough uh, consensus, try to pull enough consensus from parliament to share the sacrifices, so, so speak, that should lead to two objectives. One is fiscal consolidation. Uh, we need to, you know, decrease our debt. It's, uh, it's very high. It's 100 20% of GDP, and two, it has to kind of jumpstart growth because the real problem in Italy, uh, and that's, you know, kind of typical, I mean, and very peculiar, is that in the past 15 years, you know, GDP has been completely flat. We had almost no growth in terms of per capita income, actually, we went back to about 15 years ago after the crisis. And uh, it's, it's how do you do this is, is not going to be easy, but the only way we possibly, you know, uh, achieve these two objectives is try to kind of um, have some sort of, uh, you know, sharing of the, of the sacrifices. And this is why it's trying to pull, you know, people from different sides of politics and to have at least the, the uh, support from two, two opposite parties. So this is going to be difficult because remember that unlike Greece, Berlusconi was very controversial for for his supporter. He was a sort of messiah, and for uh, for uh, you know his uh, you know opponents, he was some sort of you know mafia leader. So to try to pull together these two coalitions is going to be very very difficult. And that's the big problem Mariamonte is facing. Uh, in Greece, the problems are of different nature. Greece is coming out from at least three or four years of huge cuts, huge sacrifice. Uh, GDP is, is going down the drain. Uh, unemployment is soaring. And you know, the, the, Greece is in, in a terrible shape. It's it's uh, it's already it's already in default technically. And you know, there are, there are debate about you know how much how large the haircut will be. You know, it's going to be 20% uh, of outstanding debt or 50% is even more. So it's, the, the situation is already totally deteriorated. And so Greece is what if things go wrong with Monti, Greece is what Italy would look like in a couple of years. But we are not there yet. Right, but, Mark. What do you think? What's your take? Well, I have a different take on it because, you know, I agree that uh, people are worried that the scenario that has unfolded in Greece could easily uh, could unfold in Italy, and in fact, that's what the markets are really been panicking about. Because, but but the the problem is not that Italy won't enact the reforms that the European authorities are trying to. Uh, force upon them. The problem is that they will. If they do, that is how you got the Greek scenario. The Greek government cut uh, the budget, uh, tightened their budget, and that slowed the economy. And so then revenues to the government fell, and they had to cut even more in order to meet the targets that were forced upon them. And so they went into a downward uh, spiral. Their interest rates on their debt went up, and that added to their uh, costs 
And so this is exactly, and then of course now they're shrinking at five and a half percent annually. Their debt is 166% of GDP. It was uh, 115%, which was actually manageable when they started this program uh, back in uh, January uh, uh, or May of, of, uh, of 2010. So if Italy goes down the path that the authorities, which are the European Union, the European Central Bank and the IMF are forcing upon them, they could very much uh, end up uh, like Greece. And that is why you see their yields already soaring uh, past 7% in the last week, uh, which adds uh, quite a large amount actually to their interest burden. And by the way, that's what really matters. It isn't just the percent of GDP uh, that's debt, it's how much they're paying in interest. So this is really, it's the policies that are completely wrong. It's not so much a debt crisis as a crisis of bad policy coming from the highest levels and being forced upon the, the peripheral countries, including Italy, Greece, Spain, Portugal, and, and Ireland. Uh, Paolo? Well, I, I think I, I agree to some extent, but uh, I don't really don't think that the Italy will follow this path and for, for a number of reasons. First, because it doesn't have to, in the sense that the Italian problems are very different from Greece. I mean, our budget in terms of a primary budget that is excluding interest payments is, is in, in balance. So it's basically zero or it's a small surplus. So, of course, when you add interest, then it, it goes you know, to a 5% deficit. But 5% is not 32% as was Greek. Greece when at the start of the, of the crisis. So if we manage to, to uh, reduce the interest cost, our balance is much better in a much better shape than Germany and France. So the, the real issue there is to convince the markets that the, some of the structural reforms uh, you know, are, are, will be done for, for, for real. And the structural reform are not just uh, wild budget cuts. It's something very different that Monty will, will, uh, will do. There will be some reform of, of the pension system. I remember that in Italy, there are so, these sort of seniority pensions in which thousands of people, you know, retired in their early, I mean, late 30s, and this is very unequal. There are reforms of the labor market where we have kind of uh, people which are kind of in the industry worker about 50 years of age, more or less, that are totally covered against anything that could ever happen to me. They cannot be fired. Nothing can happen to me. Them. And we have, you know, uh, young people with no protection whatsoever, total flexibility, no pension, no guarantees, no unemployment subsidies, and so on. So this, and then we have a lot of uh, rents on the economy. We have the association of journalists, professors, taxi drivers, lawyers, and you name it. They are, you know, defending their own jobs with teeth, and they are kind of. Uh, you know, uh, putting out huge barriers to competition. So this is the thought. Uh, thought uh, this is the sort of thing that Monty will will have to do. The budget cut will be there, but we, they, they don't need to be huge. In as far as markets see perceive that the, this reform measure that. To some extent, are measures that are kind of increasing equality because uh, Italy is a very unequal country, particularly the young and the old, and you know, old and young generation, the north and the south, so on right. and so forth. So, that, that is the sort of thing he'll have to do. And once he comes to the market, I think uh, as the uh, interest rate will go down eventually, then no cuts will be actually be needed because, as I said, the primary balance is already in a small surplus. Mark, so what do you make that these are the issues that Monty has to address? No, I really don't agree. I mean, sure, some reforms are necessary. We need reforms in the United States, too. You know, it's like the, the right wing here argues that you have to cut Social Security and Medicare in order to get us out of the, uh, the uh, slow growth, high unemployment trap that we're in. Now, that's not true. I mean, they can do anything they want with regard to pensions in Italy. It's not going to make any difference in terms of... Europe is, is, is already sliding close to recession. They just lowered their projections to a half percent growth for next year. And Italy's projections actually have been lowered since they uh, agreed to the austerity. The IMF has lowered their projections in the last six months because of the uh, $75 billion that they're going to cut or 1.7% of GDP over the next year. That will slow the economy. That will make their problems worse. And the other reforms, some of them are good, some of them are bad. Uh, you know, we don't really need to, it's not going to help it to, to cut pensions in Italy. And it, it, it isn't going to convince any uh, markets that they should have uh, confidence. The markets are looking at whether they're going to be able to, whether, you know, uh, they're going to be able to pay their debt and maintain their debt service and or whether they're going to end up like Greece. 
And they're not, I, I agree uh, that they're not, probably not going to end up uh, like Greece because they won't do the things that Greece did. There will be a lot of resistance to it. And so hopefully they'll come out of it. But right now uh, they're doing quite badly. And, uh, and the policies that they're adopting are making it worse. That's the basic uh, national income accounting of the situation. Uh, I mean, Paolo, what do you make of that? That, that the fundamental thesis that austerity is needed in order to create confidence in, uh, for the bondholders and the banks, that that's the fundamental problem, that policy. It actually yeah. leads to a deeper recession. I think that Mark is more or less making that point. Yeah, but you have to remember, I mean, I get this point. I mean, it's, a, it's an old point, but we are starting from a situation in which uh, the ratio of uh, revenues, tax revenue to GDP in Italy is around uh, 47%, and the ratio of government expenditure to GDP is around 50%. Now, we are not talking about the US, okay? We are talking about uh, a country which has a huge role of the state, in which, uh, you know, uh, major in cities, run the water supply, the electricity, and they do it very, very badly. I mean, the cost of electricity, of gas, uh, of water in Italy is huge, and, and this leads to a lot of corruption in the country. So we're now not talking about squeezing, you know, we are talking about taking out of, poli of the politician, you know, uh, uh, plate a, a lot of waste. This is what we are talking about. And in terms of, of uh, solvency, I agree that this is the key, but, you know, solvency from a technical point <laughs> depends on basically three parameters. One is the, the primary balance and, and the of primary large to GDP, and that's fine for Italy because, as I said, it's almost uh, is in balance. Then you, you have two key other issues. One is the real interest rate, which has now gone on the roof, you know, through the roof. And the and the the second, the, the third actual parameter is the rate of growth. So. It, the, the, what Monty will have to do, and he knows it very well, will be to convince markets that you know these reforms will actually go, are, will be able to increase the rate of growth, which have been stagnant over the past years. And if that if that happens, then interest rate will come down, even without huge adjustment in the primary deficit. So the real issue is to boost growth to try to convince market that you know this is something that will work because if that happens then solvency will be taken care of remember that just one year ago uh, the situation in italy was not that different in terms of fundamentals in you know gdp was 120% as it is now you know and the primary balance were more or less the same what was different the difference was the credibility of the government was not tainted yet now berlusconi has totally lost his credibility, not only for the sex scandals and these sort of things, but is his lack of manage, management of the economy. So that was, you know, something that changed and drove us interest rate from, you know, where they spread from two to, to almost six percent to six percent. So uh, that means that, you know, with the same level of fundamentals, you may achieve, you know, things maybe go very bad and can, you know, possibly uh, go back to where they were one year ago. That, that is what Monty is doing. He, he knows very well that the kind of of very straight jackal will will lead the economy into depression, but I think it will avoid this mistake and will try to you know to address the solvency problem and try to push the the rate rate of growth up, and that that what I think he will try to do. But that is not going to be easy because, as I said, you have to you know go under interest of very powerful lobbies, the lawyers in Italy. They have, you know, the parliament is full of lawyers, even the personal lawyers of Berlusconi, uh, you know, and then you know all sort of profession needs to liberalize very badly. And, and there is also a question of uh, efficiency and, and, you know, privatizing all this, you know, waste of resources that is kind of under well, politician. Well, pa Paolo, just to just make sure I understand. So you, you think the, the big issue facing Italy actually is privatization. That's where the efficiency no, no, is no. going to be found. No, no, no. The big issue is, is the rate of growth. And uh, the other big issue but how you, is... But how do you increase growth? What's the fundamental strategy for that? Yeah, that's going to be the tough thing uh, because, um, you know, to raise growth, you have to kind of remove all sort of, of things that kind of inhibit growth. And uh, what are these things? In Italy, the situation is that you have plenty of lobby 
of lobbies that defend their own interest with their teeth. I mean, the unions is not the, the one particularly tough on that, but you have lawyers, you have, uh, uh, you know, uh, notaries, you have <laughs> taxi drivers, you have, uh, you know, people in, in who do uh, small trades, you have a powerful com confederation of, of industries. So you have all this sort of, all sort of barriers to entry in this market that make it very, very difficult, for example, to young people to find a job, right. you know. Uh, in, uh, let me, let me get Mark in. So, uh, Mark, I think you agree on one thing together, which is growth is the issue, but I don't think you have the same point of view of how to get to the growth. No, I don't see anything in this story that promotes growth, really. Uh, what are you, cutting pensions, making it easier to fire workers, some kind of reform of taxi drivers? That's not going to, that, that's, you're not going to get growth out of that or from privatization. I mean, the big threat to Italy, and there are two threats to Italy right now, one uh, or three, really. One is the actual austerity which if you cut 3.9% uh, of GDP uh, out of the budget, which is what they're pledged to do over the next couple of years, you're going you're gonna to slow growth or put the economy into recession. Two is what they're doing to Europe overall, which is also uh, putting the regional economy closer to recession. And uh, three is the interest rate on those bonds, which is causing a financial crisis in Europe. And that's, by the way, not just that's not going to go away just from Italy adopting these reforms. That's a problem of the eurozone. That's a problem. How did the how did these uh, these uh, bond rates go up so high? It wasn't anything Italy did. It was the it was Greece and the imminent default on Greece, which, by the way, they haven't taken care of either. Yeah, they're going to need at least 80 percent haircut there. And they're not even close to that. So this is a problem of the European authorities making a mess out of the regional economy. That is number one. And, and Italy making their economy worse is number two. Uh, and the austerity, uh, of course, is the big part. Of, and these structural reforms, yeah, okay, fine. Some of them, as I said, you know, most of them are bad, uh, just to hurt people more. Some of them will make things better, uh, you know. And, uh, okay, but, but, they, but, but none of them are going to address quick, the most Mark, immediate Mark, problem, Mark. which is threatening not only Europe, yeah but actually the whole world economy right now. So Mark, just very quickly, so if, if the objective is growth, what, what should be done? The most important thing, well, for the European authorities, which are making these decisions, by the way, is not the Italian government, really. Uh, they're just being you know, pressured to comply with what the European authorities are deciding. And they need to restructure the Greek debt and really write off enough so that it's sustainable, so they don't have to default. And they have to guarantee the interest rates on Italian and Spanish bonds, which the ECB can do but refuses to do. They refuse to take any of the measures that our uh, Federal Reserve has taken in the United States, which could resolve that problem. And then they have to have, they have to actually have a stimulus instead of uh, the reverse uh, is what they're doing. That is the, the policies to shrink the economy. They have to have uh, expansionary policies to actually grow. Those are the three things that Europe has to face up to, and this idea that the confidence fairy, as, uh, as Paul Krugman uh, calls it, uh, is going to come to the rescue, I, I just don't buy it. Okay, Paolo, just a final word to you. What do you make of Mark's prescription? Well, I mean, it's it's kind of funny. They look very close to what Berlusconi has been saying all over, you know. And what Berlusconi has been saying all over is that it's not Italian fault of Italy. It's just a question of speculation by foreign markets, and it's just all the, the you know the fault of the uh, of of Europe, and it's all contagion from Greece, and you know, and has given you know the fault to everybody else. I don't think that. I think that is true. I think that's kind of you know propaganda. It was propaganda for Berlusconi. I'm a bit uh, surprised that. I I hear have this, exactly the same stories from liberals in the U.S. Uh, I, I think it's a question of perspective. I mean, uh, you have to take you have to take into account that Italy is a very different kind from the U.S. It's very very different. Uh, as I said, you cannot go through expansionary policy when you have a, a ratio of government spending to GDP of already 50 percent, huge inefficiency in the public sector, a, a tax pressure which is you know about 48 percent of GDP. 
uh, revenues over GDP. So there is no space for expansionary uh, policy in Italy. There is exp space for expansionary policy in Germany, in Holland, and maybe in France, and that was, should be done. I mean, those countries should expand, and, and that, you know, I agree, but Italy cannot do it with, the, with that ratio of 120%. It simply doesn't have the opportunity to do that, and, it, you know, it just there is no space for that. So the only thing it can do is just to try to some sort of uh, you know, measure to boost the rate of growth. And I agree that the, you cannot expect this sort of policy to give results in the very short terms because, after all, we are talking about st the so-called structural reform, and the structural reform are basically, you know, the, you know good for uh, su the supply side of the economy. But you cannot do much, in Italy at least, on the demand side. So the point, I think, is that Germany should take care of the demand side and should run expansionary policy. You know, Germany has also a huge uh, current account surplus, but Italy and, you know, countries like Greece don't have that option and they should kind of try to boost the uh, supply side to boost the rate of growth. I don't think there is any other things. Then, then there is a question of architecture of, of Europe that is just uh, crazy. And uh, and now we ha we don't have, you know, a lender of, of last resort uh, as the Fed, the ECB is not willing to do so. But you are you you really have to ask yourself from from uh, you know from a, an American point of view, uh, would you go? Uh, you know how 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 much would you be, be willing to do to save Canada, for example? You know you probably won't have, want to waste your money to save Canada if Canada were in dire straits, which is not. But that what, what that is what the Germans are are, are saying. You know, why should the kind of central bank kind of bail out Italy? Why should we pay for their pensions? You know the uh, you know, it's it's crazy. It's crazy. They will not, from a political point of view, uh, you know, it, uh, Europe is not a country. Europe is a kind of uh, coalition of nations with very opposite uh, in, uh, interest. And it's very hard, you know, just to convince the German that they should bail out the Italians. It, uh, it's understandably so. I think the same question would arise if the, if, uh, uh, if the U.S. was asked to rescue Canada. I mean, they probably want to say, you know, to the hell. Uh, so it's 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 very difficult to do that. So well, they, uh, my... they they probably would have to do something about Canada, seeing as that's where most of their energy comes from. But at any rate, yeah. Mark, uh, I need to give you a chance to respond before we conclude. Well, I you know I think if if we have if you have a common currency, uh, a currency union, and a common central bank, well then that central bank has to be a lender of last resort, not just for the private banks, but for the sovereign governments too. Otherwise. You're stuck in this situation uh, where the only way you get out of it is, uh, you know, basically to shrink your way out, to just go through a long recession and maybe depression. Uh, and then eventually, if you uh, succeed, if you're lucky, the rest of the world uh, pulls you out of the economy. And that's basically what we're being presented here with, you know. And I think... Uh, you know, what's really going on here is that the European authorities have a vision that uh, uh, they want to remake this, you know, Italian or the Greek economy in the image that they would prefer. I personally don't uh, think it's terrible. By the way, France has a higher percentage of GDP that is the state than Italy, but nobody's screaming about how that has to change. Uh, so why do they want to change Italy? Because they can, okay? They want to uh, and who's dismantle they? Let's, let's some get, of the welfare state there because Mark, this Mark, is the problem is that is. these authorities see the crisis as an opportunity. It's kind of like what Naomi Klein wrote about in the shock doctrine. They don't want to let this opportunity go by just because it's going to cause a recession in Europe for them to do this. They, they know that once the economy is growing again, it's going to be harder for them to force the changes upon the Italian people that they don't want and wouldn't vote for. And the same for Greece and the same for Spain. And, and so this is what they're doing. They're playing with fire. They're pushing this financial system to the brink of implosion. They're slowing the entire world economy. They're going to hurt our economy here because they want certain reforms that the people of Italy and Greece and other countries won't vote for. It's the opposite of democracy. It's the opposite of sound economic policy. And nobody should go for it. Okay, okay, I got to give you 20 seconds, Paolo, and then we're going to wind up. Just a very final word. 
Yeah, well, I mean, as, as you were saying, I mean, they who is not the international speculators, I hope. These are institutions, and we, we have a European Parliament that has been voted by all nations, and we have, you know, kind of this day, so it's maybe, it may be the ECB, but the ECB is not dictating anything to anybody. You know, it's just making clear that his own mandate is limited. Now, I agree that it's a fault of the, uh, of the uh, European architecture that uh, we don't have a lender of, of last resort. I agree. That's a big problem. But you have to remember that the way, uh, the crazy way in which uh, Europe had been built, uh, that is from the roof downward, was exactly supposed to avoid the lender of the last resort because this was the only way that the Germans were convinced to give up, uh, you know, their, the Deutsche Mark. You know, they were afraid like crazy that we'll have to kind of print money to save and to finance Italian deficits. And that's the, why they put all these debt ratios and limit in the Maastricht Treaty and so on. So the only possible way that that uh, the Germans were you know convinced to 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 join the euro was to put you know these strict limits to the possibility of the central banks to finance uh, to finance uh, budget deficits in the countries now this may this may be crazy now it turned out to be crazy but that's the way it is and it's gonna what I'm saying is gonna be very very difficult to convince the Germans that, you know that they should they should do that they would rather go back to the Deutsche Mark and split from from the rest of the you know uh, peripheral countries, and uh, I don't think uh, you know they will be ever convinced that they should kind of have a central banks like the Fed because that would mean political union, and they don't want political union. That's uh, you know as simple as that. Okay, well let's just say this is just the beginning of discussing a very complicated issue. Thank you both for joining us. Thank, thank you. you, and thank you both for joining us on the Real News Network, and we will continue this this discussion in further episodes soon. Thanks again for joining us on The Real News Network.